Well, good morning. I'm Mark Cansey, and the senior advisor here at CSIS, and I'd like to welcome you to our event this morning. Before we begin, I have a routine safety announcement to make in the unlikely event of an emergency. Uh, I will give instructions about what we do. We will either stay here or exit through the front door or through the back door. Today, CSIS is publishing a, a report on Afghanistan, and that report is made possible by the generous support of the Koch Foundation. Uh, the report is, uh, I think, on all of your seats. There's the executive summary. The report will be available. In fact, I think it's available now online. You can't hear me? OK. I will speak louder. Uh, the report is available online. You have a copy of the executive summary in your seats. And uh, James in the back will have copies of the hard copy, the full report for people who are uh, interested. The plan today is that uh, I will discuss the report for a few minutes with these uh, slides. Then we will uh, turn to our uh, uh, panelists. The panelists uh, will, will talk about the broader <coughs> issues that the report raises, military civilian uh, decision making, um, what constitute a appropriate military advice, um, making decisions about end states and the achievability of nation building. I would note that the panelists are uh, uh, deeply involved in these issues, but they are not responsible for the contents of the report. They may agree, they may disagree, they may ignore it. Uh, we're going to focus on the broader issues that the report uh, raises. Uh, and then we'll have a short Q&A at the end so you can ask questions about either the report or issues that the, um, have come up in the panel discussion. So with that, let's move to the slides. And uh, OK, can we have the, uh, um, uh, I'm going to give a quick summary of the study. Everything I touch on is discussed in more detail in the report itself. For those who want to uh, dig in deeper, and I say if you have questions, you can ask those uh, at the end. Now, can I get the next slide? Uh, I see a cursor moving around there. I hear a clicking here. Uh, all right, we're gonna we're gonna try something. Uh, a moment for our technical difficulties here. It's a well, let me move on to the, the, the first slide, uh, which you can't see. But um, what got me interested in this issue was the fact that the United States has been in Afghanistan now for 18 years. Uh, we have spent something on the order of $800 billion. We've suffered 2,400 uh, casualties. And at best, we've achieved uh, a stalemate. There's some argument about which way the momentum is, is headed. Uh, but we are not where we expected to be. And certainly, we are not where, here we go. Uh, and we were certainly not where uh, decision makers, military <coughs> civilians, thought we were going to be when we entered into this conflict uh, 18 years ago. So this paradox between where we, uh, uh, where we are today and not having expected to be there was, got, was what got me thinking about this, pro uh, this problem. The other thing that got me thinking about it was uh, uh, a, uh, an issue, uh, uh, a concept that comes up sometimes in the military li literature, and I call it the stab in the back. Uh, uh, complaint. That is, uh, military authors complaining that the civilians set a uh, goal and didn't give the military the resources or authorities needed to achieve that goal, and therefore the military was, in effect, stabbed in the back by a uh, civilian leadership. And, uh, and that I'd say, made me a little uncomfortable. So that's what drove the report. Let's have the next slide. <coughs> 
and I'm going to sprint through uh, the, uh, the slides, I hope. All right, here we go. Um, one of the things that the, the, the focus of the report is on this question of goals and end states. We note that at the beginning of the campaign, the U.S. goals were quite limited. Uh, all right. Rumsfeld was quite emphatic that the United States was going to focus on counterterrorism, that making Afghanistan not a pla platform for future attacks. All right, let's see. All right. In 2002, 2004, there's a shift to nation building and the belief that that's the only uh, path to producing a lasting, um, sustainable, solution. And you can see all the elements of uh, nation building uh, there, uh, but a very extensive effort in effect to transform Afghan society. The Obama administration wanted to refocus on Al-Qaeda but couldn't give up the nation building goals, so it in effect continued that nation building effort. Um, and the report argues that nation building can't succeed. There are examples where it has succeeded, but it takes two generations. In other words, it's a very long-term uh, commitment. Why did this happen? There were a lot of reasons, some related to civilians, some to military. Please come on in. There are seats up in front. I'll give everybody a chance. There are a lot of seats up in front. Don't, don't, this isn't like church. You don't have to sit in the back. There are a lot of reasons, but one of them is the hubris of a superpower, and there are a variety of things that I think the United States uh, ignored, particularly the United States military, but two of them I just want to focus on real quick. Uh, one is the experience of the Soviets. Uh, when you read the literature, there's very little reference to the experience of the Soviets and what that could mean for the United States. Mostly it's dismissive, the Soviets lost, therefore there's nothing for us to learn from them, besides which we're liberators, they were invaders, uh, so we're in a very different uh, circumstance. But my argument is that to your average Afghan, the U.S. and the Soviets were often looked very similar. They were both outsiders, they spoke a different language, they were infidels, they were imposing a different uh, political and uh, social structure. And then uh, ignoring why the Taliban fight, particularly religious motivation, and my argument is that I think it's very hard for Westerners to appreciate the power of religion in many other societies because in our society, religion is a personal uh, value, not one in uh, public affairs. All right, where's my staff here? Um, can we, uh, we don't seem to be, all right, we're, we're moving, all right. Well, I'm gonna move ahead here and hope the slides catch up. Um, there was a question about the role of military advice. Should the military be involved in these questions about end states and goals? Uh, there's a theory that says you know, civilians set the goals, the military implements, the two have very separate spheres. Elliot Cohen calls this the normal view of military uh, civilian uh, relations. Uh, he's very critical of it, and in the end, so am I. I argue that at the very highest levels, you cannot separate uh, military, uh, uh, end states, politics, and military operations that they get. They are inevitably weaved together. And finally, uh, we have a, some recommendations. Uh, only two that I really want to talk about. One is creating a better dialogue between military and civilian about end states and goals. And this is one of those recommendations, very easy to make from your desk at a think tank, very hard to actually do in uh, real life, particularly when you have uh, uh, civilian decision makers who are uh, uh, wedded to particular uh, views of uh, politics and uh, conflicts. Uh, but we suggest that, that there are some ways you can do it. One of the things in the uh, report is if-then statements. So instead of the military saying, you can't do that, say and say, if you want to do that, then this is what it's going to take. And then leaving that then decision for uh, the, uh, the civilians. Um, and then the, the last one is, last recommendation, there are a whole, I'd say there are a whole bunch, is to update the military doctrine uh, manuals. 
because one of the things we found was that there's very little discussion about end state in either 3-24, which is the counterinsurgency manual, or the uh, broader uh, joint publication 3-0, which is the operations manual. Uh, they mentioned that, you know, they talk about there is this thing as end state, but they don't talk about how the decision about end states <coughs> will affect the duration and intensity of the military uh, conflict, and our recommendation is to bring some of that sense into the military doctrine uh, uh, manuals so that there can, to, to help this dialogue between senior military officers and uh, civilians. Okay, well, well, well let's see, well, let's, maybe, maybe you can see the slides that I've already, ah, there we go. All right, uh, we, we talked about that, and then the recommendations. I, I do wanna note also on the eyes wide open part the report doesn't argue that we should never do this kind of nation building uh, or stabilization campaign because there are going to be times when the president will decide to do that. Our argument is that if we decide to do that, we ought to do it with our eyes wide open, understanding what it is that we're getting into so that we can make the long-term commitment and the commitment of military uh, forces that were required to bring <coughs> success. Okay. All right. I'm gonna go back to the first slide here while we're sitting up at, all right. So having given a quick sprint through the uh, report, uh, let me introduce our panelists and we can talk about some of the broader issues that the report raises. Uh, on my left is uh, Dave Barno. Dave is a retired uh, Army three-star uh, general. He is uh, currently over at the Center, uh, the uh, School for Advanced International Studies uh, as a visiting professor and as a senior fellow at the Merrill Center over there. Uh, not only is he a distinguished author, but uh, even more important for our purposes, he commanded the coalition forces in Afghanistan during this critical period, 2003 to 2005. Uh, next, Dave is Linda Robinson, who is a senior international and defense researcher at the Rand Corporation. Her research spans the uh, whole of government strategy, low intensity conflict, uh, and post conflict uh, resolution. She is a former journalist with a lot of field work in the region, and I should note that all of our panelists have written extensively about these conflicts in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and have been on the ground there. And then on the end there is uh, Jonathan Schroden, who is a research program director and special operations research coordinator at CNA. This, no, it's just CNA. Just CNA. Uh, just CNA, all right. Formerly the Center for Naval Analyses. Um, Jonathan has deployed 10 times to Afghanistan, twice to Iraq, and traveled extensively uh, in the Middle East. Uh, he served as a CNA field representative to a variety of Marine Corps <coughs> uh, commands, and on one of those trips, he and I worked together um, at the Marine camp in Fallujah. So with that introduction, um, let me move ahead and ha uh, ask our panelists a series of questions, and the questions are designed to engender a discussion, I'd say about these issues that the report raises, um, rather than you know, forcing them to um, make introductory statements. So starting off, you know, one of the study's conclusions is that the choice of end states, that is goals, drives the duration and intensity of the conflict and that in decision-making about Afghanistan, there was very little civil-military discussion about that. Uh, so my first question is, what do you think about this question of end states? Uh, you know, to what extent is there a discussion about that? To what extent does the military uh, think about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off, I think. Um, I, I'd say the idea of end states is very well established inside the military right now, and in fact, to a fault uh, sometimes when the military is looked at by civilian decision makers. The, the military tries to go into these discussions at the NSC and the deputies committees, principals committees, with that is very much part of the dialogue because they've got that built into their schoolhouses, how they teach their officers, and you, know, you can scratch any major in the U.S. military and they can talk to you about end states, uh, and lieutenant colonel and colonel and so on. What I think their challenge is, in, in, the, in, their, in some sense, a broader challenge for the issues we're talking about today is the political leadership uh, is going to have almost inevitably a shorter term view than the military is. You know, we were talking in the, in the uh, green room there before coming in about uh, lessons learned from the recent wars. 
I mean, uh, you know, I thought to myself, who, who exactly is there to learn these lessons? On the military side, I can go exactly to the people that are learning the lessons, and I can find that major who knows about end states today who's going to be the chairman of the JCS in 20 years because he's already in the force or she's already in the force. They're, they're going to absorb these. They're going to talk about these. They're going to learn about them in their schools. On the civilian leadership side, and this is not a critique of, of uh, civilian leadership writ large, but in, in our system, there is no continuity in that leadership moving up. I can't go to, you know, I can't go to a think tank. I can't go to the State Department necessarily. I certainly can't go to, you know, the National Security Council and expect to find anybody who's going to be there five years from now mm -hmm. uh, who's thinking about lessons learned in long-term end states and strategy. So in some ways, there's, there's a mismatch between the military who continually is combing through these issues and thinking about them and trying to refine the process and trying to, to, to structure the process more to fit how they see the world with uh, civilian leadership, especially when you get, get to the White House and the NSC in administrations, three of which we've had in Afghanistan, um, it, that has very different views that's driven by other objectives that, that long term is the end of this particular president's term, which is two, three, four years from now, maybe six or seven years from now, but certainly not beyond that. So that, there's, a, there's a fundamental problem there in terms of thinking over the long horizon inside of government where the military kind of represents more of the long term thinking than the civilian leadership does. I think that's something we have to address somehow. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, thank you very much. And Mark, thank you very much for having us here doing the report and uh, invigorating this dialogue about what we have learned through these two long wars, Afghanistan and Iraq. And I know our focus today is Afghanistan, but these macro issues certainly uh, pertain to both. And I think with regard to your starting uh, question, I would, I would almost turn it on its head and say the nature of the conflict is the central issue. We have to understand it and then determine what our, our desired outcome is and where I think we've, we've been seesawing over these 20 years almost is between maximalist and minimalist uh, uh, objectives. And I think that the sweet spot is, frankly, as I'll argue in some of my answers, is in the middle. And there is a third way between an expedient, short-term counterterrorism perceived as a whack-a-mole strategy and an <clears throat> overly ambitious um, uh, counterinsurgency effort interpreted as cure all the problems in the country. Uh, so I think we have actually, through this painful period, derived some important understanding, but it's not yet inculcated. And I would say, absolutely, the military goes to school on strategy, but we have a system run by civilians, and the decision makers are civilians, and it's vital that we have a civil military dialogue. We have military input into what's achievable, but at the end of the day, these are ultimately political contests, and they need to be understood as such and our diplomatic understanding and skills are what's going to bring about the end game. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so a couple of points I would make uh, on the, the topic of end states. So one is I would, I would just suggest that end states are, are oftentimes easy to write down and easy to say, right? For example, we would like to defeat al-Qaeda. That's great, right? Uh, and it's easy for everyone to sort of agree, yes. That would be a good thing to defeat Al Qaeda, but when you get into the nitty gritty of, but what does that actually mean, right? What what does the defeat of Al Qaeda actually look like? Um, that's a much harder question to answer. Um, and so I would argue, in fact, you know, two years ago at CNA, we, we did a study that was congressionally mandated to look at U.S. government efforts against Al Qaeda since 9/11 and to assess how we've done in that, you know, on that front. And the goal there, right, was to disrupt, degrade, and defeat Al Qaeda which again, sounds great. But when you start to unpack what does that actually mean, you start to understand that the articulation of those terms looks very different to a military audience than to a civilian one. Um, and further, when you start to, again, sort of ask people like, what would the defeat of Al Qaeda look like if you were to bring it about? We couldn't find a consensus articulation of that anywhere in the US government. So again, it's easy to say that, and it sounds good in a speech to say, you know, the strategic goal of the United States is the defeat of Al Qaeda. But what's often lacking in these discussions about end states is, what does that actually look like? If you were to achieve it, how would you know that you had achieved it, right? What is the vision for getting to that end state? 
and I don't think we have enough granular conversation on that part of the discussion. So that's one part, uh, point I would make. The other point I would just say in response to, to David's comment, I, I agree with you generally speaking on the military as an institution in the longevity, but I would just point out that the war fighting institutions that we've used for these long wars actually do not have that type of longevity internal. In fact, they have the exact opposite problem, which is they have such rapid turnover that you can go out there six months from now and 50% yeah. of the people will be completely different. So the end states that might have been devised at the start of you know, a commander's tour, a year later, you have a whole cadre of people who weren't there when that, those discussions took place and who may or may not fully understand why those end states were written the way they were, what they actually mean, what the vision was. So the warfighting entities that we have lack that, that continuity that you talked about. Yeah, I might, if I could jump in there yeah. and add a thought. I, I think one of the uh, fundamental questions when we look at the Afghan war over the last 18 years is how much of what we're seeing now is, is a stalemate, an un unsatisfactory outcome as a result of failure of conception and how much of it is failure of execution. And to Jonathan's point, you know, one of the things that's, that I've, I've harped on for a number of years is we simply have no continuity in this effort whatsoever. And it's not just at the battalion and brigade level who are in rotations in Afghanistan for four months in special operations or seven months if you're a Marine or nine months if you're in the Army now. It, it's everybody in the program. So to, to date in 18 years in the Afghan war since 2001, by my count, we've had 11 different U.S. ambassadors and 17 different U.S. overall commanders in Afghanistan in 18 years. It, there's no enterprise I can think of that would be able to be successful at any strategy if it had that kind of turnover in its top leadership, and that cascades all the way down to the bottom. The, the bottom numbers are even more abrupt than that. So there, there is a fundamental question here is, can you actually make anything like this work if you don't have any continuity whatsoever in your leadership? Even, even in Vietnam, from 64 to 72, 73, we only had two commanders, one of whom was there for most of the other's tenure. So we've broken that model and, and we've actually fought this war. It's not just a, you know, 18 one-year wars, it's, it's more like 36 six-month wars. It's, it is unprecedented in how the U.S. has ever pursued any conflict I'm, I'm familiar with. Uh, my next question so follows from this one on end states, which is the shift that occurs in 2002, 2004, from the early Rumsfeld focus on counterterrorism to the broader nation building uh, strategy. And my question is, first, do you think that that was true? And second, what sort of discussion occurred around that change? Because looking back on it in any case, and Heinz State is of course very useful, uh, that was a profound change in what the United States was trying to do. And of course, you were there. Having been there at that time, yeah. Uh, I, I and I have responsibility for at least shifting the military strategy from one that was very narrowly focused on CT to one that was broader in a what I call more of a, a holistic uh, counterinsurgency strategy that fo focused on the things we now you know, recognize as counterinsurgency. This is long before the manual was produced. And when, in my initial assessment there, it was apparent to me that we really didn't have a functioning military strategy. We needed to broaden beyond you know, simply whack-a-mole operations for very short periods of time in the country. But, I, but different than perhaps in later years, I also saw a lot of value in, the, in keeping a very light footprint. When I got to Afghanistan in 2000, late 2003, we had 14,000 U.S. troops on the ground. By most people's definition, that's not an occupation when the country has 31 million people, and it's a third again larger than Iraq. So the, the, the U.S. footprint was actually pretty modest, pretty limited. Uh, and it, it, our, our numbers rose to around 20,000 by the time I left. But we were very, very conscious that we wanted to have a very limited military operation. We wanted to maintain that. I would take issue with the idea that, that we shifted, we, the U.S. writ large, shifted to a nation-building strategy. Clearly, there were aspects of that that were uh, unfolding during that period of time. The Afghans had a constitutional lawyer, Jirga. They developed a constitution in the U.S. Uh, with some academic help and some diplomatic help uh, w was involved with that very much. Um, but I think if I went to Don Rumsfeld in 2004 and, and told him that we were doing a nation building operation in Afghanistan, I would have had my head caved in. Uh, I had it caved in for many other things, but I hadn't, didn't have it caved in for making that statement at least. So uh, it, it, it was, in some ways, I, I would characterize what we were doing back then as something closer to what Linda described as the middle course, mm -hmm. not the full all-in macro, full resources, you know, fully resourced counterinsurgency and not an absolutely minimalist effort where 
our goal was to get out as quickly as possible, but, but some limited middle ground. In military parlance, the term of art for that is economy of force, that our, our role was secondary or tertiary to other U.S. military efforts, especially to Iraq. And so part of my, my goal very clearly in my mind was to keep the effort contained at a very limited level, but still do as much as we could with the resources that we had. So there definitely was a shift, but probably not, I would argue probably not as, uh, as distinct as black and white as you might suggest. Okay. I mean, my, my comeback, and then I'll tell it to Linda, would be, I, and I think that's probably true if you said that to Rumsfeld, but my comeback to Rumsfeld would be, if you read the Afghan constitution, this is a nation building document. It talks about um, a strong central government. It talks about you know, democratic procedures. It talks about rights of minorities and uh, uh, religious uh, uh, rights. It talks about empowering women and, and uh, girls. I mean, it's got all of those elements of, of nation building baked into it, even if we didn't recognize it uh, at the time. But, but, but their yeah. document, not our document, too. Yeah. Uh, but we said that we were, I mean, certainly later in the Obama administration said, you know, our goal is to implement this thing, to help the Afghans implement this thing. But there are issues on which people yep. can disagree, yep. and we'll come back to this question about a middle course. Yeah. Linda. Um, yes, I'd like to broaden out, actually, that was the time period in which I met Dave Barno out yeah. in Afghanistan, and I'd like to broaden my comment a little bit beyond that inflection point. I think there was uh, what's colloquially termed mission creep over a period of time, but there were several inflection points, but I think um, it, the key distinction here is between a very narrow counterterrorism approach, we're just going to kill or capture those <coughs> perceived uh, to be a direct threat to the homeland versus trying to create some kind of stable uh, situation. And while I think it was uh, certainly correct to support a process of political and socioeconomic change in Afghanistan, which has in fact occurred, it's a glacial and, as you pointed out, multi-generational um, uh, endeavor, and that doesn't uh, preclude reaching certain uh, U.S. objectives along uh, the way, but understanding fundamentally it's the country that is changing itself, and we're enabling it, and it is that country that should be fighting the fight, and we are enabling it. And I think the macro flaw that has beset both of these big wars is too much emphasis on the mili U.S. military doing the fighting itself and relegating the all-important task of building the Afghan security forces and building the Iraqi security forces so that they're capable of uh, taking, prosecuting the fight themselves and adopt, adopting a locally appropriate models for that. And this, I think, was the big flaw, and I still think is the big flaw, <coughs> with putting all of our focus on the Afghan National um, Defense Security Forces vice the local uh, forces. And my 2013 book on Afghanistan focused on this middle way. Uh, the s village stability operations and Afghan local police initiative, which was geared to uh, recruiting local fighters to fight locally and be overseen and blessed by those local um, uh, officials and locally uh, legitimate leaders. And I think that's the model of what is right. And we had that for a moment and then I do have to say, later, the key inflection point in my view was when a narrative took hold that the root cause of the Afghanistan conflict was corruption and you had to end corruption uh, in order to win the war. And that, in the McChrystal era, and the people around him advising him sent us down a very maximalist path that I think was completely um, inappropriate. Yeah, uh, a few points I'd make. Um, <coughs> one is, just a reminder that sort of in that time frame you talked about, 2002 to 2004, the, right, the threat in Afghanistan was relatively low at that point. I mean, the Taliban had been badly damaged, Al-Qaeda had been bad, badly damaged, and this country, which had already been you know, through 20 years-ish of war, uh, there was a real sense of optimism at that time about what could be accomplished in Afghanistan. And so I, I don't want to diminish the sense of you know, th this sort of very vivacious sense of optimism that, that permeated what was happening there and the sense that a lot could be accomplished in this country that had been so decimated by, you know, a generation of war. So, so I think it's worth maintaining sort of that historical perspective for the, the time period that we're talking about. Um, but I would also mention that, 
Right, the, the tension that you talk about between sort of limited counterterrorism or a, a larger you know, nation building type mission, th those have always been in tension throughout the Afghan conflict. And, and I think you can make a strong argument that for a long part, for a long period of the war, probably you know, the last 15 years or so, we've been fighting those, those two things in parallel which is to say there were certain parts of the military that were focused on the counterterrorism mission exclusively and worked that part of it. And then there was a lot of the rest of the US government that was focused on a broader set of goals that you, you call nation buildings, other people would call comprehensive counterinsurgency, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So th those two things are not necessarily exclusive in the Afghan case. I think in a, in a lot of cases they've sort of plotted along in parallel. Where they, where they really sort of came together, I would argue, is in the Obama, you know, at the outset of the Obama administration, when they issued their white paper, um, which in a single page said very clearly at the top, our strategic goal is the, to disrupt, degrade, and defeat Al Qaeda. And that's it, that's our strategic goal. And then it said, but to do that, we will do the following. And it was this long list of very maximalist, you know, nation building like activities. Um, and so, you know, there, I think a reasonable question is why? Why would you go from this you know, sort of minimalist strategic goal to this maximalist list of, of activities in Afghanistan? And, and I think it really hinges on sort of two questions, right? One is, do you believe that Al Qaeda can be separated from the Taliban itself? That's a fundamental question that drives strategic you know, discussion and thinking. And the second is, do you believe that we need to eliminate terrorist safe havens everywhere in the world in order to prevent attacks on the U.S. homeland. Is that a necessary condition to protect the U.S. homeland? And depending on where you stand on those issues, right, it incurs risk to either the White House or the military, and that risk is not necessarily shared. And so, that, I mean, to me, to your point about this discussion about end states, n not having a clear articulation and agreement, I think, between the civilian side and the military side on those fundamental questions mm -hmm. and the risk that those entail and who should own that risk uh, has really dogged us in Afghanistan over the last 18 years. Because we did not, I would argue for, for the first 16 years of the war at least, we did not have a shared understanding of those key questions and the risk that those entail between the civilian side and the military side. And to build on your point, the, the report does point out this tension in the Obama yeah. strategy that it starts off with this you know, focus on Al Qaeda and then immediately goes into yeah. and we're going to and we're going to defeat the Taliban and have these maximalist goals. My take on it is that the Obama strategy they wanted to get out. I mean, they, they campaigned on ending the, the wars in the Middle East, uh, so they knew that the way to get out was to have a very narrow focus. But they just couldn't give up these other. They couldn't essentially even admit to themselves. All right, and we're going to relax our push for centralized government, for protection of minorities, for democratic processes, for women and girls. Um, so they ended up essentially uh, 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 building a strategy that uh, on these maximum schools. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I would argue it comes back to the idea of safe haven, right? If, if you believe that the central government in Afghanistan needs to control every square inch of the country in order to prevent future attacks on the U.S. homeland, then you need that maximalist set of goals to enable that to happen. If you believe that that's not necessarily you know, what needs to take place, right? That, that there are ways to disrupt these groups without necessarily having the central government own every last inch of Afghanistan, there are less, you know, there are sort of minimalist goals that you could choose to, per, to pursue. But that's not a discussion that oftentimes takes place, right? I mean, this, this idea of safe haven you see it throughout U.S. counterterrorism and strategic documents on Afghanistan for the last 18 years, and it's never discussed in any real depth. It's, it's a very sort of surface level, we need to reduce or remove safe haven. Why, right? I mean, uh, and, and is that actually true? It's this built-in assumption that we've carried for 18 years. Um, when I talked about the report, one of the points I made was about uh, military and civilians working together on decision making and the notion that, on, on the one hand, that maybe uh, civilians set the end states and the military implements, but the uh, um, converse or the opposing view that these are uh, so intertwined that at the top levels, um, the uh, 
the choice about end states and the politics involved in that and military operations are all woven together. And the report comes out uh, arguing that the military needs to be involved in these uh, discussions about uh, goals and uh, end states. And so my question to the panelists is first, do you, do you agree with that? And second, uh, if so, how do you, how do you uh, encourage that dialogue between senior military uh, officers and civilian officials, particularly when you're in a situation where civilians are very often telegraph their preferences for uh, policies. Pick one former senior official. Uh, Secretary Rumsfeld was very clear in the very beginning you know, that he um, wanted, some, uh, wanted very narrow focus and really wasn't interested in uh, 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 dissent. Um, uh, okay, I mean, I'll throw a thought or two. I mean, I'm, I recall uh, General Shelley Kashvili, who was the chairman of the JCS uh, during the Clinton administration, speaking to a military audience some years later, saying, sometimes you have to speak up before you're asked. And a lot of this dialogue, I think the conditions are set for it happening or not happening by, of course, the civilian leadership. You know, Secretary Rumsfeld had his own personality, had his own views. It was very clear to the military leadership, I think, uh, that he was in charge and that he expected you know, full support for his views. Uh, there, are, there seems to me to be little indication in the literature of having any real discussion with the Joint Chiefs of Staff about the longer term political and national impacts of going into Iraq in 2003 as an example of that. Uh, and so I think in, in that era the military uh, confined their advice in a lot of ways to how to do things as opposed to whether to do things you know, invade Iraq or sustain the campaign in Afghanistan or go in other directions. And, and that, in some ways, is problematic because the, the military is a repository of a great deal of expertise on the use of armed force by the nation. They shouldn't be setting the goals, but they, I think, should, should uh, find themselves in a position and, and make sure they're part of the dialogue that includes the cost of whatever goals are being set. And, and, in, and at least in that way, contribute to setting those goals. But it's, but it's a slippery slope. I mean, the military, my, my, uh, as I listen to people talk now and, and uh, interact with people who are currently serving, uh, it seems to me that a significant chunk of the military seems to be drifting towards the school, the Huntington School or the normal school, as LA calls it. Well, you give us the mission and, and we'll, we'll get it done, but stay out of our way while we're doing it and give us what we need to make that happen, as opposed to the school, which I, I also tend to support, which is the, these are very serious discussions. The military and the civilian leadership have to be involved in the details of military operations, have to understand those. But the, the conditions set by the civilian leadership are going to have a lot to do with that. The military is going to have to push back against that if the conditions aren't favorable, as they in some ways weren't in the Rumsfeld era, to be able to give advice that ex, ex, goes beyond simply saying how we're going to do this. You know, you raise an interesting point about uh, the joint chiefs not being involved, particularly in the decision to invade Iraq. That's my understanding, at yeah, least. Yeah, no, and I, I, but I think the literature supports that. And my, you know, reading Franks's memoirs, he says he didn't want their input, you know, that, that they were the Title X, and then they used an expletive, um, and that, that this was none of their business. So has Goldwater Nichols inhibited this discussion because now it's the combatant commander reporting to the secretary and the president and we've sort of cut the, the Joint Chiefs out of these decisions. I think there's some truth in that. I mean, this, the this U.S. Central Command commander was the key player uh, in the invasion of Iraq. He was certainly the key player throughout the war in Afghanistan. The Chief of Staff of the United States Army, who had most of the troops in both of those theaters, didn't have much of a voice in any of those discussions. In fact, there was, you know, I, I lived through this and, and when I was the commander out there, there was a very clear tension between Central Command and the United States Army every single day about resources. And I actually left Afghanistan and went back onto the Army staff, which was not terribly a friendly place to go after you had been on the CENTCOM side of the ledger, uh, and found that the, the term, term of art was for the Army supporting CENTCOM was feeding the monster. That CENTCOM was the monster and you could not, you know, the Army was constantly feeling like it was being squeezed and pushed and cajoled into supporting yet another new requirement, yet another new requirement, and, and it was very, very tense and very, very difficult. So I think the service chiefs uh, play a much different role. That, that's ameliorated a little bit, I think, in the last few years uh, as the, the joint chiefs have kind of realized this. But I think in that era, there was a, this great line between the combatant commander and the service chiefs, and the service chiefs were not involved. But 
in a lot of the operators' decision making as best as I can see. Okay, Melinda. Yes, thank you. We um, uh, ran with some colleagues. We put out a study in 2014 called Improving Strategic Competence, which you cite in your study. And we tried to really look deeply at this issue of how strategy is made and this civil uh, military dialogue that needs to go on. And it does start, of course, with having a commander in chief who values and seeks the best professional military advice, which is the job of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And that's absolutely vital. And not to have uh, <coughs> civilian appointees or, who, are, who are so hubristic that they uh, do not uh, think that they need to understand the professional uh, military perspective on what war is and how wars unfold. Um, I would say there was, during the period of um, Holbrook and uh, his effort as the special envoy for Afghanistan and Pakistan, there was an interesting dynamic that went on. And I sat in on many of these meetings, and I think Dave did too, um, the PAC, the Pakistan-Afghanistan uh, Fed Forum. And it was this unique gathering of, of both academics and officials uh, engaged in the Afghanistan process. It was held over at the Pentagon, but they were piping in from all over, outstations militarily, but also the State Department, the White House, and so forth. And it was a really fantastic example of the kind of ongoing dialogue you need to try to understand these conflicts and how you can get uh, to your desired goal. Then Holbrook started having his shuras over at the State Department and, and de-linked the civilians from this uh, military-initiated dialogue, but it was very much uh, an, an open uh, tent collaborative approach. And then I believe also with Doug Glute at the uh, White House, there was just a lot of bureaucratic infighting about who was in charge and so forth. And that's very uh, destructive, I think. But it really has to be the civilian setting uh, the process, and that process needs to be collaborative. And then on the military side, I think it's very important, as John has already alluded to, to, to understand with most of these conflicts, it's not a matter of total military defeat. You have to understand the political nature of the conflict and what is the politically accepted settlement or outcome. And this is, even if we care about those Al-Qaeda fighters that are coming to attack us, or in the, com in the Cold War era, we're very meshed in Central America. Those conflicts had their own dynamic. We just cared about it because the Soviet Union was supporting the communists there. But you have to understand, you, you resolve the conflict through a, pe a political peacemaking process. And we're finally reaching that point uh, with Afghanistan. And I think it's critical for the military doctrine and the things you talk about in your study to have that fulsome view of how conflict End and not simply look at it as a military endeavor. Thank you. Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, uh, I agree with the points that they've made. Just a couple of things that I would uh, sort of foot stomp. I mean, w one is the, the idea that you can separate, right? The civilians just give a, give a goal and the military goes and does it. I, I would argue that that probably works fine if what you're trying to do is optimize the ability to assign blame in the <laughs> aftermath of something having gone wrong. Right, which is to say, oh, the wrong goals were chosen, so it's the civilian's fault. Or, no, the military just couldn't execute, so it's the military's fault. But that's not a really helpful way to try and, it's not an ideal way to try and enact foreign policy or national strategic you know, strategy. So, I mean, I would argue, as they've alluded to, a teaming approach is a better way to try and get after you know, what you're trying to accomplish. But in order for that to work, the civilians have to right, be willing to engage the military in, and, and sort of allow them to be part of the conversation and not just dictate to them or browbeat them to the point where they, they, the civilians get what they want, right? I mean, if you read the first 100 pages of Cobra II, Bernard Trainer's uh, book about the Iraq War, I mean, it's a fascinating, right, depiction of how Rumsfeld just browbeat CENTCOM into the ground about the level of troops and not doing stabilization planning. Right? I mean, it's just, it's a fascinating, you know, Sib Mill uh, uh, read. Um, and so that's, that's sort of a model of how not to do it, right, as a civilian. Right? You've got to create space for the, for the military to, to be involved and to provide their best military advice. And on the military side, they, they have to understand that after that has happened and the civilians make a decision, 
that you then have to walk away with that decision in hand and, and execute in, in accordance with that. And you can't do things like leak classified assessments to try and you know, get a different outcome or get more resources or you know, sort of paint yourself a different picture historically than what the conversation might have entailed, right? So th there's, there's got to be a more of a teaming approach as opposed to an us versus them mentality. One of the issues that's come up in a couple of our comments is the question about a middle way. Because when you read the literature, very often it's depicted as a, you know, e either you, uh, you go in, you do whatever you were going to do, and then you leave, uh, or you, you stay for two generations to transform the, uh, the country. But both Dave and Linda have, you've talked about some middle ways. Now in the report we talk, we look at the, uh, the British Raj in India as a uh, mo possible model where the British were able to basically uh, run a country of 400 million with a very small army because they worked through local leaders and they did not try to uh, transform the, the country uh, socially um, uh, and culturally. But I want to talk a little about, give you a chance to talk a little about this um, middle way because it seems that that you know, might be attractive uh, as an alternative to a full-scale comprehensive coin or nation building or, or whatever you want to call it. Do you want to try that, Linda? I know you had, said, um, you yes, had some points so, on it. No, right. I'm happy to jump in. Thank you, yes, and thank you for giving that opening because I do think it's important. I mean, we, first I want to stipulate, we all agree the endeavors we've been engaged in have cost too much and not produced a quick enough satisfactory outcome. So really I'm, I'm pushing this line of analysis in my work over the past a uh, couple of decades has, I think, formulated some pretty clear prescriptions for uh, the way ahead. But with regard to the Raj analogy, I would just say, in this case, the US, of course, is not trying to uh, develop and maintain an empire. We're trying to ensure that we don't have to be involved in the long term. So there is a natural uh, off ramp there once you get a capable enough force, which I know we'll get to talking about that with regard to uh, Afghanistan. But I think that is absolutely the right uh, model to uh, look at using that local um, capability, their local knowledge, so also intelligence, and very critically, you had the political officers for which uh, I think much credit goes for it to the British model, and those people had very long-term uh, 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 postings and, and deep understanding. And why I've tried to emphasize here, we must value and understand the role that our diplomats play in this. And I understand your report is very focused on trying to derive the lessons for the military, but I think it's important that the two uh, go in tandem. And I would like to uh, suggest that I think Excuse we me. have the best chance of succeeding if we pursue uh, that model. That said, however, we can't do it everywhere. There's a limited number of, of US forces and our priorities have to be set and we really need to decide where it's worth putting more than less effort. Okay. I, I think, if I could jump in on that, I think one of the um, potential failures, we, if we look back and determine where we made, and there's a you know, potpourri of mistakes I think we made in the war in Afghanistan, but one of them I think that was somewhat recurrent throughout is placing, not placing the main effort of our military enterprise on building Afghan security forces that could carry the fight forward. Yeah. Uh, I remember going out to visit uh, Afghanistan for about a week in uh, 2010 time frame, um, early 2010, and uh, visiting the 82nd Airborne headquarters down in Kandahar. I'd only been there for a few weeks and sitting with the division commander and his staff around a table and uh, they were you know, all energized. They were gonna be there for a year. They knew what they wanted to do, and they laid out their plans for us. And, and at the end of the brief, I said, how would your plans change if I told you that you were gonna be in Afghanistan until the war was over? Uh, that your command wasn't going home, that you were staying, your people were staying, and you, you were gonna be there till this was finished. And they all sat back in their seat. I said, don't worry, I'm not gonna go back to Washington and suggest that. But, and the division commander said, that would change everything. We would do this, we would do that. And, and the primary thing he said we would do is we put all of our chips on the Afghan National Army. We would do, and instead of taking the war of the enemy ourselves, which is what Americans do when you give them enough capability, we would have put all of our effort into training the Afghans to take the war to the, to the enemy. And, and for many years, certainly during the surge years, uh, 
the, you know, my observation from that trip alone was that the Afghans were doing a very, very modest to minimal amount, and the U.S. was going full hammer and tong against the Taliban, taking immense casualties and fighting the war by themselves with 100,000 American troops and another 50,000 other NATO troops there. That's a huge flaw when you're trying to have a sustained counterinsurgency approach. And, and as a result, in, in, in some ways, we still have an Afghan national army and security forces that are not as capable today as they should be after 18 years of effort being invested in. So I think that's one area where the U.S. needs to actually think about where, where should we be putting our money and our effort and our energy and our best commanders and our highest priority as we're fighting this war instead of on our own efforts to beat the enemy on you know, our, our host nation, our partners' efforts to beat the enemy, which we really did not do well. May I just do a quick two-finger because I think it's very important to note that the U.S. Army uh, as the main burden carrier for this mission has not taken security force assistance uh, seriously enough as a mission. They do have now created security force assistance brigades, uh, but they need to make sure that force uh, uh, receives the best training and support and is able to do that ongoing mission, even if we are also trying to rebuild, prepare for, and deter major conventional war. Yeah, I mean, I would just suggest, right, it, it, it's, it's got to be condition dependent, right? I mean, there's not sort of a one-size-fits-all solution to these types of things. I mean, there are some situations where, you know, let, we intervene and we just get out immediately and then look to sort of disrupt a terrorist group in the aftermath. You could point to Libya as not an ideal, you know, situation, not an ideal example of anything, but a situation in which we found ourselves in a model where we did withdraw quickly, and yet we've been able to sort of keep I the ISIS capacity there in a disrupted state through periodic strikes and limited, you know, limited actions. So, so there is an example of where you can still attain your, your sort of limited objectives through that type of approach. There are other examples that you point out in the report where you do full-blown nation building for 40 years and it works fairly well, right? Germany, South Korea are, are sort of common examples. There are examples of the middle <coughs> ground where, you know, look at Colombia, right? Where we had a very modest presence in country for a very long period of time and we achieved ultimately sort of what we set out to accomplish. So it's highly conditions dependent upon, you know, what sort of what approach you take. I, I think our mistake is we oftentimes don't do enough analysis of those conditions up front to enable a discuss or sort of a decision about, okay, what approach are we actually going to take? I mean, in the example of Afghanistan, the first, you know, 10 years of that war were nothing but steady mission creep over time. Right? I mean, when I was at, at CENTCOM, one of the things I did was a lot of analysis of, of troop structure, troop numbers relative to violence levels. And what was fascinating was for the first 10 years of the war, there was a one-to-one -one correlation, both of them increasing exponentially over time, year upon year upon year. Um, and it was, it was such a strong correlation that in, in 2008, the J2 there asked me to do a prediction for the entire year based on simply that trend. Just project that trend forward and let's see how far off are we in terms of the level of violence in Afghanistan for the entire year. And it turned out to be off by 2%. So, you know, whatever the underlying structural factors were, we were just continuing to feed into that year after year after year in, in, in sort of a straight mission creep kind of way. Well, to sort of build on that and some of the comments that people have made, what have we learned from the 18 years of this conflict? And what do we still need to learn and implement to make sure this doesn't happen again? And I'm going to start with Linda in the middle, because she, of course, has written a whole <coughs> study on this, and then uh, give uh, our, our other panelists their chance. Well, I, I have touched on the, what I think are the main lessons, and we derived seven in the uh, study that I mentioned. And of course, the first one is to really uh, work on the uh, art of strategy. Uh, and this is something that requires, I think, not just having it in doctrine, but having a process. And not just, I understand the rotational churn of commanders, but this has to be a generalized understanding so that your people in office, your civilians, and your military personnel 
understand the art of strategy. And so I think this is fundamental. Then, of course, you have to have that process of the civ mill dialogue. Number three, you have to, as I've tried to emphasize, understand that all of these wars occur in a political context, and you need to have what I really insist on is the end game is a political, a vision of what's a political settlement or a political accommodation. Uh, that is feasible and achievable. And then you align your efforts accordingly. To go in, as we all saw, to go into Iraq with no plan uh, for <coughs> an insurgency that would pop up, you've got to be prepared for that and some degree of stabilization. And we have, we can talk more about this, but there have been some really important developments in resizing and appropriately dividing the labor of a stabilization mission. It has to be implemented, but we've done some good uh, work there. And then, as I say, go small. Use the special operations and advisory forces to develop uh, the ability for those countries to defend themselves, and in a turnkey way. So we were definitely, and this is where I think our Afghan model is still too top heavy, too costly, and it's going to affect what the end game looks like there. Um, and then, uh, if you don't mind my cheat sheet here, we have to um, leverage our multinational uh, and interagency partners. And I think that's what the whole of government, much maligned often many people say, there is no whole of government. Well, if you don't leverage all of your partners, um, the cost winds up being to the U.S. Treasury. Right. Dave, you want to? Yeah, I think those are terrific lessons. Yeah, I would endorse every one of those. Um, I think we need to develop some better capability and maybe some accepted models for how our military and our State Department uh, actors interact in these operations overseas. Um, I, I, as, I, as I walk through the litany of how many commanders we've had, how many ambassadors we've had, there have been numerous cases where those commanders and those ambassadors failed to get along with each other, didn't have the same outlook in terms of what the goals and objectives were, uh, were providing minimal support for each other's efforts. Uh, there are other occasions uh, uh, where the two worked very, very well together in kind of a seamless team, and I think created outsized results during their periods of time in Afghanistan, only in a couple cases. Uh, so I think finding a way to normalize that, you know, I did some testimony a number of years ago saying that we ought to consider for the Afghan war, finding the next U.S. commander, finding the next U.S. ambassador, having them assemble some small staffs, put them together in Washington, D.C. for three months before they go to Afghanistan, make sure they see life eye to eye, they get along with each other, then deploy them to the theater for three years. You know, we don't have to bring them back on sailing ships. We can fly them back every you know, six or eight weeks if we need to to take a break for a week or do briefings in Washington. You know, it's the 21st century, but keep them out there for a long time. Keep them out there together, have an integrated civil military effort. We have done extraordinarily badly at that. We have not institutionalized any of that, and it's all <laughs> episodic, and it's, a, it's, a, it's personality dependent. And, and on the ground, at least, that's one of the factors that's essential to success. At the strategic level, I would agree with, with Linda. We've got to think about the strategy. We've got to have more, even back here in D.C., more continuity in our strategy. And, and, and I would also uh, suggest, I don't know how to make this happen, but the Congress of the United States has to play a bigger role in these operations, has to play more of its oversight role, has to be more engaged. One of the reasons I would argue that we've been in Afghanistan for 18 years is that there hasn't been hardly any congressional interest in a war in Afghanistan in 18 years, with a few notable exceptions. That's not healthy for the nation. It's not healthy for the military or the civilian diplomats that are out there. And, and that's got to change if we're going to be able to sustain these operations and reflect what the, the will of the American people is accurately. Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I fully agree with all those points. Um, just a couple of things that I would add. I mean, one is, again, sort of coming back to the nature of your paper with the Civ Mill discussion, I, I think it's important for any civilian leaders now or in the future of this country to sort of recognize that the U.S. military does not like to and will greatly resist optimizing itself for non-conventional wars. Right? It just doesn't like to do that. Uh, and so if you're going to ask the military to do that, you have to understand that there's, there's going to be some resistance to institutional reorganizations and optimizations and other things that have to take place, especially if those <coughs> wars are of a non-existential nature. Right? I mean, these are, these are limited wars of choice that we fought, and the, the approach has generally been to try and do them on the side while the institutions, you know, the military services, continue to do the things that they do day in and day out, right? And, I mean, Secretary Gates wrote extensively about his frustrations with that 
um, and, had, and he, he went so far as having to fire a number of four stars in the Air Force to get what he wanted in terms of unmanned aerial platforms and the like. Um, but it's worth recognizing that, that that's likely to continue to be the case. Um, and then one other lesson I would, I would just sort of footstop what Linda said, which is another thing to recognize is the US military does not have an organic competency designed to build armies of foreign countries, right? They have some capacity to do that in you know, some parts, like the, the special forces, right? The Green Berets actually have that as a mission, but they can't do it to scale because there aren't enough of them. And the US Army does not, until just recently with these SFABs, right, which are still a very new concept, does not have an organic capability that aligns to building the military of a foreign country at scale. And so it's another thing where if, we're, if the civilian's gonna ask the military to do that, we need to recognize that's not an inherent capability that the military has. Um, then if you want to sort of read a, a great overview <coughs> of that, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, SIGAR, has a fantastic lessons learned report about security force assistance and building the Afghan security forces. And that's one of their main findings is we, we just don't have that sort of, you know, core uh, division to core and echelon above level capability to build a foreign nation's army. Let me ask one final question now, we'll move to uh, the audience and then I have a couple more that we, we might have time for. But this is the one that we talked about back in the uh, green room there. Uh, there are reports that the negotiations uh, on Afghanistan with the Taliban have maybe made some movement. And I was wondering what you thought about the prospects for a negotiated uh, peace. And I'm going to start with Jonathan this time because of course you've written about yeah. how you believe the military has changed its uh, war fighting approach to prepare for a negotiated settlement. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. It's still obviously an open question. Um, there's been a lot of activity in this space, right? So we'll talk about measures of performance versus measures of effectiveness. There's been a lot of activity over the last, you know, nine months with Ambassador Khalilzad and, and his efforts. And, and it seems that he's made some progress in narrowing the positions of the US and the Taliban in these sort of bilateral discussions that we've been having about the four issues that he focuses on, right? Which is um, US withdrawal, a comprehensive ceasefire, intra-Afghan talks, and then some type of verifiable guarantee by the Taliban <coughs> that, that they won't allow Al Qaeda or the likes of ISIS to use Afghanistan for international terrorist attacks. Um, so, Right, he, he, he sort of tweets periodically at the, at the end of every one of these iterations about how much progress they've been making. Now, in March, he tweeted that we were agreed in draft on the two major issues between us and the Taliban, that being the, their verifiable guarantee and our withdrawal. Uh, but we still haven't seen now, in, you know, in July, any sort of released, you know, what does that entail? There haven't been any details given as to specifically what does that agreement in draft look like? Um, in addition, until just recently, it looked like there had not been very much progress, if any, on the other two issues, the ceasefire and the intra-Afghan talks. Um, the interesting thing that just occurred this last weekend, though, is the intra-Afghan conference that took place in Doha, where even though the, the, the uh, Afghan government was not allowed to participate in an official capacity, they did send representatives in a non-official capacity um, to attend this, this conference, and the readouts from it seem to indicate that the discussions were actually very substantive and in some cases quite emotional. Um, and the readout, uh, which is available online, is, is surprisingly substantive, much more so than the prior two conferences they had in Moscow where everybody sort of showed up and read, you know, prepared statements and there was a very anodyne uh, communique at the end of the conference. The one that was just released contains, you know, some specific, um, I would call them metrics for gauging the seriousness of, of both sides going forward. It has seven or eight points that they, they describe as a roadmap to peace. I might call them sort of some desired, um, you know, next steps um, that the two sides wanted to see. So it was, it was actually a surprisingly encouraging event um, that took place. So again, there's, there's been sort of steady progress, steady activity. Whether or not we can actually close the gap between where we stand and where the Taliban stand and whether we can get the Taliban to engage formally with the elected government of Afghanistan remains to be seen. And those are not insurmountable. Uh, those are not, you know, insignificant hurdles that we have to get past. Okay, we'll move down to the 
Linda. Yes, I, this is just a critical moment, and I'm glad we're ending with this question because this is, tell me how this ends. This is the end game right now, getting those four objectives linked together and not agreeing to withdraw until a credible Afghan peace process is truly underway, ideally with some type of uh, roadmap to which uh, the parties are formally committed. And I, I have to say, military pressure and attrition of Taliban is not the key here. Uh, to achieving that objective. The Taliban can fight all day long. They've got enough funding and fighters to fight forever. Uh, it is about the military should be focused like a laser on getting the Afghan National Security Forces ready to hold the fort themselves. And, and I, I think John wrote, wrote a very good piece about this in May in War on the Rocks. And I think it's very important for the military to be clear about what its mission is in this final phase. Um, I also want to say I think the administration did an excellent uh, and dramatic and high stakes maneuver by cutting off Pakistan aid, but that we've talked solely about this internal dynamic of the Afghan conflict. That was vital uh, to put the Pakistanis on notice uh, and to show the Taliban and that there was a, a willingness to sever that lifeline. And now it's about using the leverage that we have to get this thing to a political uh, deal and to prevent the spoilers within the Afghan government, uh, within these factions. Because really, if you look at this political situation in Afghanistan, it has many traits of a civil war. So we have a very delicate and important period ahead of us. Yeah, I think uh, all of us would agree that there's not going to be any final solution to this particular conflict that is there's absent a political uh, negotiated settlement. Other, other than the other, one or the side or the other surrendering, which is not in the cards. Uh, but I'm also uh, relatively pessimistic about where this is taking us in terms of the outcome for Afghanistan. The, uh, you know, I, my, my sense is that this administration, far more so than the uh, Obama administration or the Bush administrations before it, is very willing to take a, an agreement uh, at almost any cost and, and have an agreement on paper that may not be enforceable in reality two, three, five years from now. Uh, for the price of getting American troops out of Afghanistan. I think we, we all seek that goal, but I, I think that a uh, few of us would like to see that uh, with conditions where the Taliban effectively takes over the country. Uh, and my suspicion is the Taliban have enough military strength, as Linda alluded to, and the Afghan security forces, for, for many reasons, are still relatively less capable than they need to be in the face of the Taliban threat that uh, if and when the United States decides to withdraw in a negotiated settlement, that at some point in the ensuing couple of years, that settlement's liable to fracture and that the Taliban have a very strong possibility of moving militarily to take over the country. And I think there'd be very little to stop them doing that. So I, I'm concerned about where this is going. I think it's, uh, it's important that it's the only route we have to have this ultimately settled, but I'm concerned that we uh, accept uh, conditions that are going to lead to that end state, which I don't think anyone in the United States or in Afghanistan really wants to see. Yeah, if I could, I mean, just yeah. to, to follow, I mean, I, it, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. I, one of the things I've been doing recently is going back and reading about the peace talks that ended the Vietnam War, right? And so many people have pointed out, right, parallel people like Brian, Cro Ambassador Crocker, for example, have written about this, yeah. the parallels that he's seen. Um, so I've been, you know, reading some books about how those negotiations took place. It, it's fascinating to see in those, those discussions historically the shift from negotiations as a means towards some end, towards some objective, to the negotiation, to, to getting a deal itself as the goal. And so I, th I think that's going to be a really key thing for the U.S. going forward in these negotiations is maintaining the negotiations as the vehicle to get to some end state, you know, political outcome that, we're, that we seek to achieve, as opposed to allowing ourselves to become convinced over time that a deal of any of whatever it looks like is the goal and therefore we're just happy to get it. One of the things that st struck me about these negotiations is our apparent willingness to give up these nation building goals and to really just focus on this very narrow question about preventing Afghanistan from becoming a launch pad for future uh, attacks. Um, uh, and to take a take Take us a long time to get there. I mean, the Trump administration, of course, has been very critical of nation building, and Trump himself has been uh, critical of that. But we seem to be back to where we started uh, after you know a long uh, and very painful road uh, and trying to transform Afghanistan. 
But I could ask a lot more questions here, but I know that the audience has some. So uh, 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 two things. First, wait for a uh, microphone. And second, please have a question mark at the end of your statement. And the gentleman right here was pretty quick off the mark, so I'll. <coughs> Excellent session. George Nicholson, the Washington Liaison for Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. Dave, I remember years ago you made the point of your discussions uh, in the country that they would say, you've got lots of watches, but we've got lots of time. And going back to your comments for what happened in Vietnam, when we had Vietnamization, we said, okay, we're going to provide you all this huge logistics support, we'll pull out. But two years later, Congress said, we're going to pull the plug. And I remember what, how frustrating that was to Gerald Ford. And it's like uh, Admiral Bill McRaven says, you know, we can surge forces, but we can't surge trust. And if we create that climate, like you said, we pull out and leave them in the lurch, like what we're doing to the Kurds and everything else, what's that going to do for worldwide, you know, uh, trust in us that they can uh, depend on us to do anything? Well, I think that's part of the issue in, is the, in looking at the outcome of the negotiations. And in, in my view, the outcome of the negotiation won't be the settlement and the deal. It'll be what Afghanistan looks five years later. And, and, and I think you know, we're spending about, I think I've seen a variety of numbers, but about $40 billion a year on Afghanistan. Uh, we got about somewhere between 10 and 14,000 troops there right now. Um, and you know, if we take the troops out, I think that money is gonna follow at some point in time because con Congress of the United States, $40 billion is a significant chunk of money. And I doubt they're gonna be willing to put anything like that kind of investment in Afghanistan if there aren't American troops there. And I think that's the goal of the negotiations to get those troops out. So I'm, I'm concerned about, again, what this looks like five years after the ink is dries on whatever settlement gets reached. And it will affect us worldwide. There's no question about that. Anything our other panelists want to add? I would just, I mean, I would just say, so we did a study, uh, it was another congressionally mandated study in, in 2014, looking at an independent assessment of Afghan security forces. And we've done several follow-on studies to that. One of the, the things that we were asked to look at there was two withdrawal scenarios, one in which we remove advisory forces from Afghanistan but continue to fund the ANDS, the Afghan security forces, and then a second scenario in which we remove both advisors and the funding. Um, and, and our assessment there was if you take away the advisory support aspect to the Afghan security forces, that they start to rapidly diminish in capability um, and probably within two years, they're, they're going to be functionally incapable of doing a lot of the things that they need to do, especially when it comes to the, their Air Force, which they just cannot organically maintain or sustain at all. Um, and so that's highly problematic. However, comma, if you continue to sort of pay for salaries and that type of thing, I think there's general consensus that the country would sort of muddle along for some indeterminate period, although it's hard to discern for how long. Um, that said, if you take away the advisories and the funding, the whole thing falls apart very quickly, right? I mean, the, the, the centripetal forces that sort of naturally exist in Afghanistan will tear the sort of coalition that exists internally apart in very short order if there's not that funding coming into the, you know, in from the top. Uh, the gentleman over here. Um, I uh, this may betray my ignorance. Uh, this may betray my ignorance about Afghanistan and even understanding of all what you said, which is extremely articulate and intelligent. Where are the Afghanis in all of this? Not as recipients of your advice, your assistance, and so on, nation building or military, but owning a process, owning an objective, running eventually the country. Uh, it sounds to a foreigner like me as if you are inadvertently, of course, crowding out the potential for the Afghanis taking hold of their future, making them dependent, making them addicted to that foreign assistance, and perpetrating the problem. Sometimes it's, it's hard to recognize that countries have, in the end, to develop themselves and owning what they are doing. And sometimes some tough, tough love may be necessary. I don't know. I, I speak, of course, on, on our experience of what it took us to turn around. So, uh, but I've seen it again and again and again in many other countries. So my question is, what, if anything, uh, is the role of the Afghans to take on their ownership, not with your assistance, but on their own, and hopefully lead the process? 
Linda. Yes, I'd like to just offer a quick clarification, and I'm sorry because I think we have been very much talking about the U.S. role in, but it is absolutely clear that this intra-Afghan dialogue is to be conducted by Afghans, and they are the ones that will determine the acceptable uh, terms of a settlement. And that is absolutely up to them to determine what form of, what does the role of Islam in Afghan society, what type of power sharing, because they do, they have to work out the power dynamics in a country that is very regionally uh, distinct. There is a central government, but you ignore the regional realities at your peril. Uh, in, in Afghanistan's case, though, there is, I agree with, uh, there's no alternative but to have some outside uh, funding to support their security apparatus. My criticism is that we built too expensive an apparatus uh, that is not sustainable, and I think we need to uh, start uh, adjusting that. But there will be, I hopefully, international support. NATO has uh, agreed to continue its support, and uh, I think that there's uh, certainly Afghan ownership of its government, of its intelligence services. So I would not like you to go away with the feeling that this is all, you know, cat's paw, that the U.S. is running the country. It is not. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add to that. If you, so I wrote a, another paper on War on the Rocks uh, a few months back that looked at the cost, the distribution of costs in Afghanistan, both human and financial. And one of the things that emerges is that the U.S. is paying the vast majority of the financial cost of the war in Afghanistan. Uh, at least on you know on our side of it, uh, largely because the Afghan you know Afghanistan as a country just doesn't have the GDP, doesn't have the economic wherewithal to support its security forces, as as Linda said. But if you look at the human costs of this, the blood being <coughs> spilled in Afghanistan today and for the last three years, really really five years, is overwhelmingly Afghan. I mean, there's you know six to seven thousand civilians being killed every year there's ten to fifteen thousand of afghanistan security forces are being killed every year the taliban are you know it's hard to, to judge their casualties but probably quite similar ten to fifteen thousand dead on their side a year so there there's there's great carnage on the afghan side they're the ones who are paying the price in blood for this um, so so i think that's worth calling out to your point, though, about creating dependencies, we have absolutely done that, especially with the Afghan security forces, based on the types of things that we've been providing them, which are technologically and, and just beyond their ability to maintain and sustain organically. So there's a huge contract logistics tail that we've created for the capabilities that we've given them because we have effectively built their army to try and operate the same way the U.S. Army operates because the U.S. Army is the one who has built them, right? So we've built them in our image, and we've tried to give them all of the same types of capabilities that we have, even though they don't have the ability to maintain or, or sustain or organically use those things. And so that tail creates long dependencies, and we continue to sort of exacerbate that, the most recent example being this shift from MI-17s to you know, Black Hawks, which is going to set back their, the development of their Air Force by at least another 10 to 15 years from where it was two years ago. Now, there's, there's real strong political reasons for why the U.S. decided to do that. That was about congressional support rather than any operational consideration. But nonetheless, it creates yet another set of dependencies that are going to persist for the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah, the gentleman over here. There's a microphone coming. Um, my name is Nassim. I work for uh, Vice of America Afghan Service. We have a TV broadcasting one hour for Afghanistan. Uh, during the 80s uh, till mid 90s, I was uh, in Peshawar working with USIS. So I'm relatively closely familiar with the Afghan leaders at that time, the resistance, and the, uh, others after that. At the beginning, uh, whether it was U.S. government or any other foreign forces, that they uh, defined Taliban as a ragtag force, not well trained, not well equipped. So that was their definition. But now, after 18 years, uh, I, uh, I think I heard uh, Ms. Linda that uh, Taliban has uh, tremendous uh, resources and they can fight forever. Uh, there is an Afghan proverb that says that uh, horses cannot be fattened during the war. How 
which of these definitions is really true? That ragtag force or currently that we say? I think the reality is somewhere in the middle that uh, they can be defeated. Uh, we know that some of our neighboring countries, one mainly involved in finance, and also a channel of finance of all terrorist organizations in the world, especially in the Middle East. So the issue in many Afghans are not fighting with them. I will tell you why, because in 90, there were so many madrasas, and we all know that there was five million Afghan living, and it started as of 1980 in 81 and 82. So those five million, the first barons will be now 20, 25, and 30. They are those people who are fighting and they are brainwashed. So uh, I think uh, taking it so uh, <clears throat> relatively easy, I know it is not easy and uh, both sides has casualties. Nobody wants war in Afghanistan. But the current population of Afghanistan, over 20 or 20, it is hard to live with them, that's all. And if someone can explain that, that the, the difference how they got during the war while 40 countries or 24 countries were present there. Thank you. I can jump in. Yeah, go ahead. Do you want to? Like, oh, come, go ahead. Okay. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I, would, I would just comment, you know, not unlike the Afghan security forces where some units are better than others in terms of their ability to do the things that they need to do, internal to the Taliban, there are some, you know, some elements, some groups that are more capable, that are more well-equipped, that are more tactically proficient than other parts, right? Um, so in some, some places you look, you will see Taliban fighters that look not much different than they did 30 years ago, using exactly the same tactics that they used 30 years ago. I mean, you can go lead, read Lester Grau's book, The Bear Went Over the Mountain. You see the tactical vignettes that he talks about. You can look at what they're doing today, and in many places they're using the exact same tactics, and in some places in the exact same places that they did against the Soviets. So, so there's that element. But that said, they they do they are they, they do have a number of units. They've got these sort of they call them the red units that you may have read read about that are more uh, tactically proficient. They appear to have have gotten quite a bit more training whether that's provided by internal of the Taliban or it's being provided by some you know, state sponsor is somewhat hard to discern, but they're definitely better trained and they're better equipped in so much as they have things like night vision goggles and better radios. Um, a lot of that, however, has come from overrunning Afghan security force checkpoints and stealing the equipment that we've given to the Afghan security forces. So there's a fair amount of equipment that we've provided to Afghanistan security forces that has made its way into the, the ranks of the Taliban simply by them you know, attacking a checkpoint, overrunning it, looting it, and then disappearing with all, all of the material that's on that checkpoint. And this is one of the reasons why the, the, you know, the, the US military in Afghanistan has for several years now really been pushing hard to get the, the Afghan security forces to collapse their, their uh, checkpoint architecture into something that's more defensible so that they, they stop losing both men on these checkpoints and also the equipment that we're giving them. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is, is that uh, probably the best chance to, uh, if there was a chance to tactically defeat the Taliban was during the quote unquote surge, 09, 10, 11. Um, but I think it was, it was obvious to me at that point, I think in retrospect more to everyone else is that the Taliban can simply choose to not fight if they're pressured hard by large numbers of you know, Western and Afghan forces, and they simply melted away. They went back to sanctuaries. If you have a, an external sanctuary that's relatively protected, which they do in Pakistan and have had throughout the entire duration of the war, they can choose to disengage at will and not be brought into a fight when there are superior enemy forces, and then pick their place to come back and engage again. Now those forces have dropped down from 150,000 Western forces to you know, fewer than 25,000 Western forces altogether. So they have a lot more impunity to operate around the country without being pressured. But that sanctuary makes a big, big difference and has made a difference throughout this war in ways that we didn't see in, in comparative, a comparative sense in Iraq, for example.
I know we have other questions, but I'd like to just say very briefly, this is not a high cost, high tech war. And when I was referring to the streams of funding they have, they have the opium uh, uh, trade, they have uh, outside funding from the Gulf, from Pakistan and others, but it's not a high dollar effort. And the force is largely Afghan fighters, unlike say in Syria where you have a multinational force fighting on behalf of the Syrian regime. So I, I think that we, We've thrown everything we can at it, but there, there is a very adept insurgent force there. And I would just add one thing from the report, which is that it's, I think it's very hard for Americans to think about the Taliban. Uh, when you look at the descriptions of the Taliban, you know, we, we call them thugs and criminals and you know, uh, 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 you know saboteurs, and, and there's a lot of reason to say that. That's not incorrect. But I think it, it makes it difficult then to understand how is it that they're able to field a viable military force, even taking the heavy casualties that they've been taking against the world's only superpower? Uh, and so I think it makes it, it's hard for us to think about how they, how they actually do that. Okay, questions? All right, young gentleman over here. Uh, there's been some discussion today about a middle way between high-intensity counterinsurgency and a very minimalist approach. Uh, there seems to be two conceptions of how that would work, uh, both of which involve empowering forces in Afghanistan, either at the local level or empowering security forces uh, with the central government. Uh, prima facie, that seems like uh, a recipe for conflict reoccurrence, either by setting up rival warlords or having rebellion against a central government that lacks legitimacy. Could you maybe educate some of us in the room who are less knowledgeable about Afghanistan or about counterinsurgency as to why a middle road like that would work without kind of a wider transformation of Afghan political society? So I'll give a very brief answer, but I think everyone has a contribution to make to this answer. Um, the, and I would, um, I would say I think that the, um, my book, 100 Victories, describes a very careful approach to raising local defense of forces, and they are, they are locally recruited, locally overseen, they're from the area, they defend the area. Some of those elements uh, did not, were not professional, uh, and were not, uh, but they overall achieved uh, the objectives and I think serve as a viable um, model, vice having uh, forces you raise in one part of the country sent out uh, to fight in an, in an area they know uh, nothing about. But I would say this, this small coin approach, if you will, uh, requires that you equip them with appropriate material and training so that they are a, not just come along with the special forces A team as extra muscle, but that they are the lead force and that they are a viable uh, stay behind force. We have now the development of a territorial force uh, which I think mimics some of those uh, characteristics, but I think it's also very important to understand that, again, it's not a military solution. That is about providing local security for the long term. I would just add that I think uh, that having U.S. advisors or Western advisors with those local forces is critical so they don't simply become a warlord's you know, surrogate army. There are the warlords still exist in Afghanistan. They're going to exist long after all of us are gone in Afghanistan. That's not going to go away. They're going to have their own capabilities. You don't want to increase their capabilities by funding them and resourcing them and giving them weapons. So you have to build a force that's distinct from that. Second point I'd make is that, come up a couple of times, is that we, the United States, does not seem to have the ability to build a military, a foreign military, in any other image than ourself. Uh, and so w if I rebuild the United States Army in Afghanistan in either centrally or out in the provinces, I'm building a force that's not sustainable. Uh, that I'm giving it very complicated equipment. I'm giving it the most complex logistics system in the world. So we need to, to self-educate ourselves on how to build a baseline kind of one-on-one -on -one level of military that can get the mission done but not do it the same way, way that the 82nd Airborne Division has to do it because of all of the resources that we're always going to have and that they are never going to have. And we have not broke the code on that yet, which is a huge problem for us if we're going to be serious about security force assistance. And I forgot to add, this uh, force that I describe in my book is overseen by the Ministry of Interior. So it's not just a purely local force. There's a superstructure. But the key point is it's local fighters overseen by local elders. Yeah, I mean, I would just, just quickly, I would say, right, that one of the differences that you would see between a model that 
has a sort of large scale conventional Afghan security forces like we've been developing and one <coughs> model like what Linda describes is the, the number of people that you need pulling actual security duties on checkpoints and those types of things is not going to be probably that dissimilar because in a country of 30 million people, you're going you're gonna to need a certain size force to provide just basic security in sort of you know, the areas that matter. I think the real savings come in between a, a local force and a, you know, a, an actual army like we've tried to build comes in the enablers pieces, right? A local force requires less logistic support, less combat support, less combat service support. You don't need quite as large an air force in some ways, right? So the, the savings come less on the tooth part of it, if you will, and more on the tail part that's required to support that local infrastructure uh, force as opposed to a no kidding national army. Okay, we have time for one last question, and okay, I want to get one of the ladies, so right there. Caroline Jones, OSD Policy Afghanistan. Um, when we are going into these negotiations, when we accept that we've reached the point to come to a political settlement, we lose some control over what our end state actually looks like because we don't know what's going to come out of this intra-Afghan dialogue, these intra-Afghan negotiations. So I'd be curious to hear how you think, from a military perspective, we deal with this not knowing what's going to happen and not having control over our end states and maybe having a preferred outcome but not necessarily being able to determine that. And given that situation, how the U.S. military should approach a you know, unclear end state scenario I would say this is entirely up to the Afghan people to set the terms of their settlement I do have a question about whether some international mediation may be uh, required to get there I think that that may be the missing uh, piece but I think it's highly inappropriate for the US to impose terms I think one of the things the military is going to have to be thoughtful about and maybe get into internal discussions here in the US about now uh, or or what, are, what are the trip wires that would cause the U.S. to intervene again, not in large numbers, but in some ways I could see Afghanistan becoming more like our involvement in Somalia or in Libya in that when a certain threshold gets triggered, we will send forces in for some type of a short raid operation. We may in, end up using air power at certain points in time. In other words, if the, if the agreement to not become a base for terrorism is violated, what, what do those thresholds look like and what are we going to do and how do we plan to do that? Because that, I think that's a fairly high probability outcome, whether it's a year after the settlement, two years after the settlement, five years after the settlement, that's just a natural line of drift. And I think we have to militarily prepare our options and our thresholds for that now. Yeah, I would just comment that the U.S. The US has a strategic goal in Afghanistan, which is to prevent it from being used as a platform for international terrorist attacks. And so that, that goal doesn't change, even in the wake of a negotiated settlement amongst the Afghans. We still have that goal. Um, and we have, lev I would argue, we have remaining leverage to achieve that goal in the form of the financial assistance that we, that we could arguably continue to provide to Afghanistan, even in a post-negotiated settlement era. And so, so we, do have some, we do have the opportunity to create leverage, and we have a strategic goal that we want to accomplish. I think the, the key for the military is to make very clear what does it believe is necessary in order to accomplish that goal. Um, is that a residual counterterrorism presence in Afghanistan? Can it be done via an offshore counterterrorism platform of some kind? Um, could it be done with some, you know, some other part of the U.S. government, not necessarily the military? What are the options to ensure that that strategic goal continues to be met um, and to provide those, and then it's incumbent on the rest of the U.S. government to use that leverage in the form of financial assistance to ensure that we can get whatever we need in order to continue to pursue that goal, even in a post-negotiated settlement era. And I would argue that there's a precedent uh, in Vietnam, the Easter Offensive of 1972. <coughs> the United States had pulled out almost all of its ground forces, but it surged its air power to support the South Vietnamese when the North Vietnamese launched an offensive. Um, so we were able to uh, uh, help the South Vietnamese without using our own uh, ground forces. Yeah, I just, as, I mean, one final thing I just want to make. It, it's worth noting, the Taliban have said they want to get all U.S. forces out of Afghanistan. They have not said that they want to get all U.S. money out of Afghanistan. Right. That's an important <laughs> distinction. <laughs>
Okay, we have also hit the end of our time as, uh, with our uh, neighbors next door. Um, our, uh, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we have some hard copies of the report, so if you're interested, uh, see uh, James in the back there. He's got his hand up there by the uh, computer station. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for taking t time out to join us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.